Brian Denlinger has once again demonstrated his rational and theological acumen in his recent video, Yes, God the Father Has a Physical Body, which is in response to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith's assertion that God is without body, parts, or passions. In the video, Denlinger makes several blunders, which is not uncommon, and uses his typical mocking, demeaning, and shouting to bolster what are probably the weakest arguments in history. Please like, subscribe, and share this video so we can spread the truth against this pernicious error. We're going to blast through these because this is pitifully basic stuff. The original time code is in the frame of his video so you can see exactly where I've cut since we don't have the time to examine every putrid cavil he brings. This is my standard, King James Bot. Uh, well, yes, but there, there has to be a confession of faith. And making a statement of beliefs is fine. I have one on my website. But you run, run into danger when you start to say, I have this special confession of faith and this holy book and this holy book. There's two of them. And I get to kind of decide between the two which one has the right authority. That's Catholicism, okay? Divine tradition, sacred scripture. That's Catholicism. I don't know anyone saying that this confession is divine tradition. Being able to summarize your beliefs of what scripture teaches is the point of a confession. Christians, Arians, Sicinians, Sabellians, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses all purportedly believe the Bible. If you've ever perused John Biddle's 1654 Catechism, you'll find that the answers given are just Bible verses. The difference between those that confess the 1689 and Denlinger is that he alone is the determiner of what scripture means, whereas the 1689 is based on centuries of reflection on the word of God. You cannot find Trinitarian wording and phraseology in the King James Bible. Okay, I'll go over it one more time for the Trinitarians. There is no Trinity, there's no Trinitarian persons in reference to the Godhead, never in the King James Bible. There's no divine essence, okay? Uh, that's seven different things there that doesn't appear in the King James Bible. So I'm a heretic for rejecting traditions of men. As I pointed out in part one of my series on his doctrine, two of his fundamental errors are Biblicism and extreme King James onlyism. Denlinger is a heretic because he rejects the clear teaching of the Word of God, regardless of the particular words used or not used. He's not a heretic for rejecting human traditions. Now, if there's truly no divine essence, then God is a mere creation in our intellect because God's essence is what he is, and if he doesn't have essence, he isn't. Jump down to paragraph three there in chapter two. It says, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on him? You say, well, that means all the Baptist churches. No, actually, it means all the Catholic churches. Do you see the word Catholic? Right there? All our communion there. They're Catholic. We're going to compare the 1689 in a few places to the Council of Trent, which was held roughly 120, 140 years beforehand. Here's my conspiracy theory. Note that Denlinger cut off paragraph 4. We'll read it fully in short order. The Baptist Confession of 1689 is Catholic. You say, no, no, okay. Oh, you're so stupid, Denlinger. Oh, you obviously don't understand. The word Catholic simply means universal. It says it right there. Just keep reading the context. Yeah, well, funny bunny, um, I know that. But you see, uh, there's no word Catholic in here. There's no word universal in here. There's no universal church in terms of uh, that spelled out that way, or Catholic that spelled out that way. He says he understands that Catholic means universal, which is good. Unfortunately, he doesn't seem to understand what to do with this knowledge. So Catholic and universal aren't in Scripture? Then what they mean is wrong, no? If we deny that there is a Catholic church, then Christ has several bodies, several brides. Ephesians 1, and 23, God hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In 5.23, for the husband is a head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ does not have brides or bodies or churches. To deny this is to deny scripture, which is what Denlinger is doing here because of his biblicism. And the Roman Catholic Church uses the word Catholic the same as the Baptists do. So when the Baptist confessional says all of our communion, the Trinity is all our communion, they are literally saying the identical thing that's in the Catholic Catechism. That's the central core part of Christianity. Now, he's incorrect that Roman Catholics and Baptists use Catholic in the same way. The Roman use is really a misnomer, or really a negation, since it's a particular universal church. If you don't submit to the Roman pontiff and ecclesiastical system, you're not a Roman Catholic. 
Baptists affirm that there's one body of Christ made up of all those who are saved, that is, the Catholic, the universal church. Yes, the central point of any religion is its God. So the triune God of Scripture is the central doctrine of Christianity. The central doctrine of Dellinger's system is the fantastical Godhead, who is both made up of parts and unmade. If you use baptize the name in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, then you are considered legitimate by the Roman Catholic Church because you hold to the Trinity. The Trinity is the basis for all of the universal church's communion. That's what they're saying. Based on post-Vatican II politics and presentations, Dellinger believes that any group practicing Trinitarian baptism is considered legitimate to Rome. What would disprove this and his assertion that Baptists are Roman Catholics? We'll turn to the Council of Trent, held between 1545 and 1563. This council has not been struck down or condemned, so it is still official. I'll read a couple portions of the 1689 that are clearly in contradiction to Romanism, and as we proceed, will work in some selections from Trent. Chapter 1, paragraph 3, The books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon or rule of the Scripture, and therefore are of no authority to the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. Paragraph 4, The authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Paragraph 6, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. Paragraph 10. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined, and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest, can be no other but the Holy Scripture delivered by the Spirit, into which Scripture so delivered our faith is finally resolved. Chapter 8, paragraph 9. This office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God, and may not be, either in whole or any part thereof, transferred from him to any other. Baptists are Catholics. They're another one of the little prostitutes of the mother whore, daughters of the whore, of the harlot. That's what the Baptists are. Chapter 11, paragraph 1. Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins, and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and sole righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. Paragraph 5. God doth continue to forgive the sins of those that are justified, and although they can never fall from the state of justification, yet they may by their sins fall under God's fatherly displeasure, and in that condition they have not usually the light of his countenance restored unto them, until they humble themselves, confess their sins, beg pardon, and renew their faith and repentance. A Trent Session 6, Chapter 7 says, This disposition or preparation is followed by justification itself, which is not remission of sins merely, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man through the voluntary reception of the grace and of the gifts, whereby man of unjust becomes just and of an enemy a friend, so that he may be an heir according to hope of life everlasting. Now, Canon 9, if anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. Canon 11, if anyone saith that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, or by the sole remission of sins, to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, and is inherent in them, or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. Oh, they're different though. No, they're not. They're both Trinitarian. They're both heretics. The 1689, chapter 16, paragraph 3, their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the Spirit of Christ, and that they may be enabled thereunto, besides the graces they have already received, there is necessary an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. Paragraph 4. They who in their obedience attain to the greatest height which is possible in this life are so far from being able to supererogate and to do more than God requires as that they fall short of much which in duty they are bound to do. Back to Trent, Canon 7. If anyone saith that all works done before justification in whatsoever way they are done are truly sins or merit the hatred of God, or that the more earnestly one strives to dispose himself for grace, the more grievously he sins, let him be anathema. Canon 18. If anyone saith that the commandments of God are, even for one that is justified and constituted in grace, impossible to keep, let him be anathema. 
Canon 32. If anyone saith that good works of one that is justified are in such manner the gifts of God, that they are not also the good merits of him that is justified, or that the said justified by the good works which he performs through the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit increase of grace, eternal life, and the attainment of that eternal life, if so be, however, that he depart in grace, and also an increase in glory, let him be anathema. These Baptists are papists, they're Catholics. They add their traditions to scripture and then stand there in the pulpit and lie right to your face and say, we're Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. They're lying to you. 1689, chapter 26, paragraph 3. The purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and error, and some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Paragraph 4, which Denlinger didn't let you read. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church, in whom, by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof. But is that Antichrist, the man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ, and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming? Chapter 29, paragraph 1. His baptism is a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection, of his being engrafted into him a remission of sins, and of giving up into God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. Chapter 30, paragraph 2. In this ordinance, Christ is not offered up to his Father, nor any real sacrifice made at all for the remission of sins, of the quick or dead, but only a memorial of that one offering up of himself by himself upon the cross once for all, and a spiritual oblation of all possible praise unto God for the same, so that the popish sacrifice of the Mass, as they call it, is most abominable, injurious to Christ's own sacrifice, the alone propitiation for all the sins of the elect. Paragraph 4. The denial of the cup to the people, worshipping the elements and lifting them up, or carrying them about for adoration and reserving them for any pretended religious use, are all contrary to the nature of this ordinance and to the institution of Christ. Paragraph 5. The outward elements in this ordinance, duly set apart to the use ordained by Christ, have such relation to him crucified as that truly, although in terms used figuratively, they are sometimes called by the names of the things they represent, to wit, the body and blood of Christ, albeit in substance and nature, they still remain truly and only bread and wine as they were before. Paragraph 6. That doctrine which maintains a change of the substance of bread and wine into the substance of Christ's body and blood, commonly called transubstantiation, by consecration of a priest or by any other way, is repugnant not to scripture alone, but even to common sense and reason, overthroweth the nature of the ordinance, and hath been, and is, the cause of manifold superstitions, yea, of gross idolatries. Paragraph 7. Worthy receivers outwardly partaking of the visible elements in this ordinance do then also inwardly by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally and corporeally, but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death, the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally, but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. Back to Trent's is Session 7, Canon 1. If anyone saith that the sacraments of the new law were not all instituted by Jesus Christ, our Lord, or that they are more or less than seven, to wit, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, order, and matrimony, or even that any one of these seven is not truly and properly a sacrament, let him be anathema. From Session 13, Canon 1, If anyone denieth that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but saith that he is only therein as in a sign or in figure or virtue, let him be anathema. Canon 6. If anyone saith that in the holy sacrament of the Eucharist, Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored with the worship, even external of Latria, and is consequently neither to be venerated with a special festive solemnity, nor to be solemnly borne about in procession, according to the laudable and universal rite and custom of holy church, or is not to be proposed publicly to the people to be adored, and that the adorers thereof are idolaters, let him be anathema. Session 22, Canon 3. If anyone saith that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and of thanksgiving, or that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, or that it profits him only who receives, and that it ought not to be offered for the living and the dead for sins, pains, satisfactions, and other necessities, let him be anathema. Anyone who says that Trinitarian baptism is all that is required to be in communion with Rome is either ignorant or knowingly lying. These anathemas still stand, and therefore, Baptists who subscribe to 1689 cannot be in communion with Rome. Denlinger is patently incorrect in his screed. Denlinger, you stupid heretic, um, we can call ourselves Catholic. We are Baptist and Catholic, okay? Um, go down the street, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what religion are you? I'm Catholic. They're going to think that you're a Baptist or something. And, oh, no, they won't. 
I don't know what kind of interactions Denlinger has with people, but if he can only give short statements and not clarify what he means, they probably aren't worthwhile ones. If you ask a Jehovah's Witness if he believes in Jesus, what will he say? If he says yes, do you leave it at that? Ignorance isn't an argument, whether it's yours or someone else's. Ridiculous nonsense. And again, remember, 1689 Baptist Confession. You're going back to a time when Catholics were still persecuting Christians. Why would you call yourself Catholic in your confession of faith? This is a good question. It's odd that Dellinger has been studying this for years. He should be at the very least slightly familiar with religious happenings in England. After years of dealing with these things, why the ignorance? The confession was actually made in 1677 while the Act of Uniformity in England was still in effect, but only publicly signed in 1689 after the Act of Toleration. The Baptists were providing a confession to show they were Catholic in regard to the doctrine of the Trinity primarily, Reformed in regard to salvation, and Baptist in regards to church government and the sacraments. They were distancing themselves from the Anabaptists, a very liquid group, often heretical. You see, the Trinity thing, what it is, it's a, it's a confusing philosophical system that doesn't actually work out when you logically deduce the thing. You look at the thing and you say, okay, wait a second, this doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. And you know what these devils do? They say, that's precisely the point. It's not supposed to make sense. <laughs> Great is the mystery of godliness. Uh, we'll add a bunch of philosophical terms and things and combine paganism and whatever else with biblical titles, and then we'll say, you know, there, that's what it is. That's the Trinity. So it doesn't make any sense. It's not supposed to. The fact that it's confusing to you means that it's correct. If you conflate the truth of the doctrine, the necessity of the doctrine, and the ability to comprehend God, you'll be confused. From Scripture, we can show the necessity of the doctrine of the Trinity, and therefore, the truth of it. In doing so, we are not saying that we can comprehend it. We apprehend this truth. We should all affirm that if you can comprehend God, there is a problem. Incomprehensible, though, does not equal irrational or illogical. Denlinger can't prove irrationality or illogicality. The reason it doesn't make sense to him is because he denies the sense of Scripture and the categories that it forces us to think in, and thus he creates a false god of his own imagination that's like man. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He's without body. How in the world do you get that? This is referring to the Incarnation. If Denlinger had read chapter 2 of the Confession with the intention of understanding it not merely mocking, he would know why his arguments are nothing more than inflamed witlessness. John 1.14 is true, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The eternal Word who is God and is with the Father took on flesh, not that he had flesh from all eternity. Does Denlinger deny the Incarnation? What exactly happened in the virgin's womb? Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. The Catholics are at least honest enough in the Catechism that they actually admit it's a philosophical origin, the Trinity. It's a philosophy. It's all that, all that it is. But the Baptists are such liars, they won't admit to that. They'll say, oh, no, it's backed up by the Scriptures. That's what the Scriptures teach, you heretic, you. You denied the Trinity, you're outside of Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. No, it's philosophical in its origin. What philosophical system can Dellinger show that the Trinity came from? He's given various examples in the past, and none bear any resemblance to the doctrine of the Trinity. But let's show that his reading comprehension is remedial. The Catholic Catechism doesn't say the Trinity is philosophical in origin, but that certain of the terms used to explain what is presented in Scripture had their origins in philosophy, and actually, some of those words are found in Scripture. Let's let him read it himself to prove the point. From the beginning, number 249. From the beginning, the revealed truth of the Holy Trinity has been at the very root of the church's living faith, principally by means of baptism. In order to articulate the dogma of the Trinity, the church had to develop its own terminology with the help of certain notions of philosophical origin. So the Catechism didn't state that the doctrine is philosophical in origin, but some of the terms used to articulate it are. Anyway, back to Colossians 2. Not after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I've been over that scripture so many times, and it just makes perfect sense. In Jesus Christ is all the fullness of the Godhead. There's no part that's lacking there. The body, the soul, and the spirit is in Jesus Christ. It's one God composed of three parts. Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. The way Denlinger articulates it, it sounds like he's the same fleshly body he has been from eternity. He just has the other two parts of God in him. 
Now, if this verse were to bear his meaning, it would mean that the Godhead, that is, the body, soul, and spirit, are in Jesus Christ. So he has a body, soul, and spirit in his body. Christ's human nature is downplayed to the point of non-existence in Denlinger's scheme. Now, in reality, this is another incarnational verse. The term Godhead here will be covered in part 7 of my series on his doctrine. The word doesn't mean that. He's assuming God has parts and reading that into the Bible. If God has parts, he is dependent upon those parts to be and is therefore a creature. Yes, Baptists deny that God is a contingent being. James chapter 3, verse 9. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. The similitude of God. I am made after the similitude of God. God didn't just say, hey, I don't really know how we're going to make man. I'll just kind of guess or something. There's three parts to God and yet one person. Three parts to man and yet one person. This is completely untrue because God is independent and asse. This precludes God being made up of parts. If God were made up of things, he would not be independent because he would depend on the parts or things to be what he is. He would also depend upon the composer of the parts to be. This is manifestly untrue of God. Whatever after the similitude of God means, it can't mean that God has parts because this undermines and invalidates Scripture's testimony about God. Where can Denlinger show these particular words of three parts to God and one person? Where are those in Scripture? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. We ready to count here? Get a crayon ready. Trinitarians, you might be able to use your fingers, but I don't want to strain your fingers. They're, they're not really all that strong, I'm sure, because you just spend all your time on a keyboard and you don't really know anything about manual labor and whatever, you preacher boys. I understand that. So if your fingers start to hurt from going like this, counting one, two, three, just use your crayon, okay? Right? Here we go. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you, holy, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's try it again. One, two, three. And yet it's just you. Did you have enough time to write that down with your crayons? So physical labor gives you theological clout? Uh, I've done some physical labor in my life and actually recently dropped a double hung window on my toe and lost a toenail. So I feel like I should get extra points for the associated pain. Why is 1 Thessalonians 5.23 definitional of man's composition? What does Luke 10.27 say? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Does Denlinger have his Crayolas out? Hopefully he didn't have to settle for rose art. Or can he use his calloused fingers to count four here? Why isn't this verse the one? Why is this stuff so hard to get? That's the thing I don't understand. It blows my mind. The Bible's so clear. And then you get this bunch of pharisaical junk, and it comes out, God is holy and omnipresent and omnipresent. Well, of course that stuff, but they get into all these words that aren't even in Scripture. Whose subsist subsistence in is in and of himself. Chapter and verse, subsistence, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions. Lying, absolutely lying, right to people's faces. Since 1689, Baptists, liars since 1689. Denlinger says these are lying, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible without body, parts, or passions. If these are lies, then the opposite of them is true, no? Will Denlinger affirm that God's subsistence is from another? Implicitly, yes, since God has parts. He depends upon the parts to be and upon the composer of the parts. Will Denlinger affirm that God is finite in being and perfection? Implicitly, yes, since a part of God is a body and a body has a terminating point in space. God is either more or less perfect when all the parts come together. If he's more perfect when they are together, he's less perfect when they're separate. Will Denlinger affirm that God's essence can be comprehended by anyone but God? Implicitly, yes, since we can comprehend that man is three parts and God's essence is composed of three parts. Will Denlinger affirm that God is not a most pure spirit and invisible? Yes, for spirit is only a third of what God is and another third of God is visible since it's made of flesh in eternity. Does Denlinger affirm that God is passable? Explicitly, yes, since he says the Father suffered and bled on the cross. The God Denlinger worships is a warped contrivance of his own perverse imaginations, and the damage it does to the gospel is unfathomable. Leviticus 26, verse 11 through 13. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. God speaking, my soul shall not abhor you. He's talking about the Father. That's what the Godhead is saying right there. And I will walk among you. God the Father will walk among you. 
and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bands of your yoke, and made you go upright. Speaking about God the Father, and he says, I will walk among you. Uh, how can you walk if you don't have a body? Well, it's talking about God number two. If this is the Godhead, that is Jesus Christ speaking of the Father, the soul, then the I will walk among you cannot be referring to the Father. The subject speaking doesn't change. Therefore, his reading of this is complete and utter nonsense. John chapter 14. When did this happen? When did God walk among men? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't come to the soul of God without first coming and seeing the body. You get to the soul through the body? Where's Jesus' body right now? It's in heaven. So no one on earth has communion with God currently? This is nonsense. Not very difficult. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. How can you see a spirit? If God the Father is a spirit, like the stupid Trinitarians teach, you have the Holy Spirit's a spirit, God the Father's a spirit, and Jesus has another spirit. So that's three different spirits within God. There are not three spirits in God, and I don't know where Denlinger got the depraved notion that we think that. Part three of my first series addressed his and Jacob Thompson's blatant misreading of James White's book on that matter. You've seen him. How's that possible? Can you see my soul right now? No. Can you see my spirit? No. Could they have seen the soul or the spirit? Back then? No. Why would Jesus say you've seen him? Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Good Trinitarian Bathlick, apparently. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He doesn't say you don't you haven't known my father. You don't know me, Philip? Philip says, Show us the Father, and Jesus says, You don't know me? Pretty obvious. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Did the Father have a body? Yes, if the body is Jesus Christ. How can Jesus claim to be God, and the Father be God, if they're separate, in terms of two separate persons, two separate beings, then you have two separate gods, and that's heresy. Again, Denlinger is reading this fictional three parts into the text. He still can't make sense of Jesus' statement that he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Denlinger's system makes mincemeat of Scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through 23. Because that, way, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they, past tense, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. An image made like unto corruptible man. Huh. Y'all, you mean like the Trinity pictures? Uh, the symbols and things, the trachetra, the three-pointed star, and it symbolizes the Trinity, and you have the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father. You know, is not, is not, is. They're all God, but they're not, you know, the same, and whatever, in terms of the same God. Well, then your Denlinger's a modalist. I'm not a modalist. Okay, God doesn't have three separate modes or manifestations. It's three separate parts, like the Bible teaches and the stupid idiotic baptist confessional denies and rejects is man's intellectual belief not of a higher order than the work of his hands if we have a false image of god in our mind but never turn it into a physical object are we better than those who do we aren't allowed to imagine god to be whatever we want as long as we don't make a physical idol imagining god to be a parted being with the same composition as man fits the bill for romans 123 Denlinger still hasn't, nor can he, show where the Bible teaches this. He can only corrupt the teaching of the Bible regarding God. I mean, if you don't get this stuff, then you're not saved. Just as simple as that. Jesus Christ will not reveal the Father to anybody but someone who's truly saved. And if you're truly saved, you'll understand the Godhead doctrine. You'll understand what the Godhead is and how it all works out. You'll look and you'll say, well, yeah, okay, Jesus is God, the Father, 
is God. They have to be the same. They have to be connected somehow. The book of James says that we're made after the similitude of God. In us, there's three parts. In God, there would have to be three parts. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Not that difficult. Uh, can I understand every single little fine aspect of God and how he thinks and whatever? Of course not. Of course not. But just the simple basics of how God works? Yeah, not that difficult. This is a cultic tactic. Being saved doesn't mean you suddenly can ignore logic and be irrational in your doctrine. It doesn't give you the right to make statements that are internally contradictory and that contradict scripture under the guise of, well, if you're really saved, you'll understand it. Disagreeing with a heretical, inconsistent doctrine doesn't mean you're not saved. Now, if you disagree like Denninger does and refuse to understand what the doctrine is like he does and build up a barrage of senseless reasons and ways to twist scripture and call those who try to correct you unsaved, the situation does get clearer. But what you have to realize is if you're a man and your pride is blinding you and you're saying, I am not in a cult, you have to lower your pride and admit, I've been deceived, I've been tricked, and yes, I am part of a cult right now and I need to get out of this and I need to admit to myself that I've been lied to and I've been going along with it and I need to submit myself to the word of God not to confessions not to catechisms or writings of men I need to submit to the word of God Dallinger needs to submit to the word of God and not his own mangled understanding of it he needs to stop deceiving himself that he's not a self-made pope casting people out of the kingdom for not understanding his monstrous godhead the end result of his system is a false god and a Christ that is all the parts of this god, but not truly man. He thus cannot be the mediator between God and man. He cannot redeem Adam's fallen race, and he cannot bring peace to men.